Welcome to Governing Pandemics 101, a course offered by the Global Health Centre of the Geneva Graduate Institute. And welcome to this mini lecture on how to promote solidarity and health for all in international governance of pandemics, and specifically universal health coverage in the pandemic instrument or treaty. My name is Richard Gregory. I led recent work on this topic for the team at WHO that coordinates UHC 2030, the Global Multi-Stakeholder Partnership for Universal Health Coverage. And it's important to acknowledge that I'm not presenting official WHO positions in this talk, but some key points raised by UHC 2030 and its membership for those involved in the pandemic instrument negotiations to consider. Much of what I'll talk about is in a UHC 2030 policy brief published by the Graduate Institute's Governing Pandemics Initiative on why and how to reflect universal health coverage in the pandemic treaty. In my talk, I will cover three things. First, why universal health coverage matters in the context of pandemics. Second, some key health systems goals and messages. And third, opportunities to include universal health coverage in the pandemic instrument negotiations. So why does universal health coverage matter in the context of pandemics? The key message I'd like you to take away from this talk is that world leaders have a crucial opportunity in the aftermath of COVID-19 to deliver on promises of health for all. One of the ways they can do so is by including universal health coverage in the pandemic instrument or treaty that is currently being negotiated. This is about using a high level international, political, legal and accountability instrument to secure a safer and healthier future for everyone. It would be truly innovative. For those of you not already familiar with the concept, universal health coverage or UHC is the vision that everyone everywhere can access the health services they need without facing financial hardship. It includes the full range of essential health services across health promotion, prevention and treatment. UHC is a target in the UN's Sustainable Development Goals with indicators for service coverage and for financial protection from impoverishing health costs. But the world is off track on UHC. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, over 30% of the world could not access the health services they need and almost 2 billion people faced financial hardship because of the costs of health services. Let's consider three important reasons to focus on UHC in the context of pandemics. First, pandemics harm UHC progress. COVID-19 has disrupted essential health services in over 90% of countries. We have seen inequities widen and the first rise in extreme poverty in a generation. A key lesson from the pandemic is that vulnerable and underserved populations are disproportionately affected. Second, UHC principles are crucial for a successful response to health crises. COVID-19 ignited debates about equitable access to vaccines and treatments. UHC reflects the same principles of solidarity and health for all. We also know that especially in the early stages of an outbreak, it is crucial that people do not avoid seeking testing and healthcare because of concerns about its cost. And UHC is all about removing these financial barriers. Third, UHC is about protecting everyone. UHC includes the full spectrum of public health services and functions. This includes prevention and promotion, for example, public health messaging, diagnostic tests and surveillance of outbreaks, as well as management of underlying health conditions that can make populations more vulnerable when a health emergency strikes. Now, thinking back to negotiations for the pandemic instrument, when the World Health Assembly made its formal decision in December 2021 to launch the intergovernmental negotiating body for the pandemic instrument, it in fact recognised these UHC principles. The decision made explicit reference to the principle of solidarity with all people and countries and the need for practical actions to address gaps in preventing, preparing for and responding to health emergencies. And it also recognised including timely, equitable access to medical countermeasures such as vaccines, tests and treatments, and strengthening health systems and their resilience with a view to achieving universal health coverage. Having established why UHC matters in the context of pandemics and the negotiations for the pandemic instrument, 
what are the policy messages and goals that we might promote? Another way to summarise what we've said so far is that, based on the principles of solidarity and equity, we have twin goals of universal health coverage and health security for everyone. To achieve these twin goals, our key message is that strengthening health systems is the most efficient and sustainable way forward. And the pandemic treaty instrument can help stimulate action by governments to ensure the foundations of health systems and their resilience. Strong health systems address inequity and contribute to communities' resilience. Health systems built on strong foundations of primary health care, including public health functions, safeguard vulnerable and marginalised populations. They cost-effectively bring affordable, good quality health care locally to communities and they're responsive to communities' health needs. This is especially important for women and girls whose health needs are often neglected. Communities who can access trusted local health services are more likely to trust and follow emergency public health measures. Moreover, integrating public health preparedness and response measures in health systems helps countries to protect health, societies and economies. A few examples. Scaling up access to COVID-19 testing enabled tracking of disease and safe isolation. New outbreaks demand quick deployment of epidemiologists in communities to assess spread and support contact tracing. Protective equipment and protocols can mitigate disruption to essential health services. Countries with established health emergency frameworks and leadership mechanisms are better equipped to coordinate responses. Leaders can break the costly panic-then-neglect cycle by investing in health systems foundations and preparing health services. Priorities include sufficient numbers of well-trained and well-paid health workers that communities can easily access, availability of a package of essential medicines and health commodities, including personal protective equipment for health workers, and health data and surveillance systems. This can be complemented by preparing hospitals and more specialised services to deal with acute care needs during outbreaks. So the pandemic instrument could therefore establish core obligations, including UHC policies and minimum requirements for national healthcare capacities as part of pandemic preparedness. This would complement core public health capacities that are already required by the international health regulations. In addition, a systems-wide approach promotes efficient use of resources. Individual health programmes typically focus on results for a specific disease or intervention. But even well-run disease or issue-specific programmes may duplicate or misalign responsibilities with each other or the rest of the health system. So strengthening health systems in an efficient and cross-cutting way includes building the capacities of policymakers and health workers to align across and integrate programmes. So, having established why UHC matters in pandemic preparedness, and our key policy objective of strengthening health systems, how can we encourage and help members of the intergovernmental negotiating body to include these issues? The policy brief I mentioned in the introduction to this talk highlights existing UHC commitments and recommendations and proposes a checklist for negotiators to draw on. First, it includes some core principles to reflect in the instrument's preamble or framing. Starting with the overall vision of health for all, these include strengthening health systems and their resilience, government's primary responsibility to ensure quality health services with financial protection, and the importance of solidarity within and between countries. Second, it highlights opportunities to enhance existing commitments and obligations. For example, international commitments have already been made to ensure adequate public financing for health, and these need reinforcing and acting on. As I mentioned, there are also opportunities to promote core minimum standards for national health systems. And to leave no one behind, commitments can be bolstered for gender equity, with cross-cutting systematic measures to achieve it, and for reaching and protecting underserved and vulnerable groups. Third, it identifies specific issues to pay attention to, bringing together much of what I've outlined in the talk so far. These include Public health functions, for example, making the link between capacities to meet the international health regulations obligations and foundational steps towards UHC. Ensuring adequate numbers and distribution 
of well-trained, well-equipped and well-paid health workers. This should also address international recruitment of health workers, drawing on the WHO Global Code of Practice on the international recruitment of health personnel. Protecting access to safe and good quality health services, recognising the disruptions caused by pandemics. Equitable access to new health products, learning from inequities in access to COVID-19 vaccines. Key issues to address include trial and approval requirements, licensing, technology transfers, export restrictions, international stockpiles, guaranteed pooled procurements, upfront financing, and action on health systems, that is, not only the commodity supply constraints. Social and financial safety nets that protect people from impoverishing health costs and, during pandemics, protect livelihoods and enable people to act in ways that minimise the spread of disease. International solidarity in financing for health. The instrument could establish obligations for the ongoing role of international aid in strengthening health systems in low-income countries and in financing for global public goods, as well as standards for harmonised support that is aligned with countries' priorities. Multi-sector and multi-stakeholder contributions, especially the private sector, and governments' obligations to create regulatory environments that encourage innovation and safeguard quality. Social participation and inclusion of civil society and communities to ensure voices are heard and actions respond to communities' needs. A fit-for-purpose global health architecture and ensuring that measures to strengthen the architecture for pandemics are coherent with efforts across and towards all health goals. So this is obviously a long and challenging list for the pandemic instrument negotiators to consider. But I hope in this mini-lecture I've helped convince you of the potential value in them doing so. As countries look to recovery and renewal from the COVID-19 pandemic, global health is at a pivotal moment. Taking a broad view and including universal health coverage in these conversations about international governance for pandemics can help ensure we seize the moment and ensure a safer and healthier world for us all. Thank you for listening and now we'll go to some short quiz questions.